I would like to call the September 14, 2018 South Dark School Committee in session. Um, and welcome. Happy Valentine's Day. What a great way to spend it with all of you. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> glad uh, to be here. Right. Uh, as always, the first thing we'll start with is audience sharing. Audience sharing. Hi, I'm Tim Wood, if you don't remember me. I just wanted to take a second uh, to thank uh, Superintendent Johnson and Paul Desmond for all the effort they put into the uh, selection committee for the musical technology uh, item that'll be coming up later. Um, I think they did a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of organizing the process. I was there at the public sessions and uh, I was impressed with the work and I just thought you ought to get that feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, then uh, we will start our agenda with new business, and first on our agenda is the Neary School Improvement Plan. All right, we're excited. Yeah. Okay. So um, this is our Neary School Improvement Plan for 2018-2020. So as a, a staff and a school council over the past four months, we work collaboratively to identify school needs and goals while staying focused on prioritizing what we wanted to accomplish over the next two years, how we wanted to invest our time and resource into our focus goals. So we began the process by reviewing the past two school improvement plans, so looking back over the past four years and the actionable process processes we had embedded within, the, within those two goals, two plans, we uh, were excited by the fact that the majority of those goals had been achieved and are now deeply rooted into what we do each day, hence the tree. Uh, mm -hmm. and, that, um, and those are what binds us together, and we continue to celebrate um, all that blossoms and flourishes at Mary. So as we um, move through our new plan, we will continue to learn together, we'll engage in continuous reflection, be able to identify the barriers that hinder our growth, and make adjustments as needed. Uh, the priority, of course, remains, uh, keeps us focused on student growth and achievement and meeting the needs of our learners academically, socially, emotionally, uh, with the collective ownership of all of our students. So, I have, um, over the past two school improvement plans, and this one as well, we focus on four uh, guiding questions. The first being, what do we want students to know and be able to do, and that's our mass curriculum frameworks and standards. How are we going to get the students there? That's our curriculum and instruction and best practices. How are we going to know when our students are there? Those are our assessments, summative and formative, and our in -cals. And what do we do for those who aren't there yet or have gone beyond? And that's through response to instruction, small group instruction, our building-based support team, our professional learning communities focused on students, and by customizing the student goals. So in looking back over our two years, and of course this, the plan that we're in currently in goes to the end of 2018, but under our goal one, um, school climate and culture. And I have continuous blooming up there because these are the things that are embedded into what we do each and every day. So this year, we kicked off a year-long uh, Choose Kindness theme. <coughs> so we started with a one school, one read, the entire school read Wonder, and then traveled to a school field trip, on a school field trip to see the movie, which was just wonderful to sit in the audience with all of our students and hear them gasp where they should gasp and applaud where they should applaud. It was, it was a great experience for, for all of us. And we share a daily wonder each day during morning announcements. And of course, we continue with our caught caring cards. We still have our bi-weekly Friday farewell meetings where we focus on team building, community outreach, student spotlight, caught caring themes, and on our off weeks, we have grade level team building opportunities. For our school-wide community service projects, we have Andy's Attic, Candy for Troops, 
This year, we partnered with Settler Senior Center, so we're providing them with, uh, with uh, place maps for their spe special events, and we also, we have volunteers who come on Fridays for our pause for reading, so they'll sit with our students and the dogs that come in as the kids read to the dogs. So it's really a nice opportunity to engage the seniors in what we're doing. We also have Southborough Food Pantry and our pajama program this year where we collected pajamas for Puerto Rico, Texas, and Florida. And many of our school-wide community service projects are student-driven. They bring an idea to us and we let them run with it. And it's, they, they've done a terrific job with it. And then of course, including families in the learning process through school events. We have a near, near, near Literacy Night Community Read Day. And then on March 1st, we have our Near Noodle Night. So very excited about that. And we have our author visits. We had an Osmo Readathon this year. And um, again, our Community to Read. And certainly, not, certainly, last but not least, is how we communicate to the families and we have our virtual backpack. This year, we're doing a video virtual backpack every Friday, so parents can just uh, watch me on YouTube and hear about the updates from the week, and we still communicate out on Facebook and Twitter. For our curriculum instruction assessment goals, we continue to have grade level meetings. Our professional learning communities focused on data collection and analysis. Over the past three years, we've really focused on reading and writing. And this year, we've also included math. Um, and we've been working with Kathy Lazar, our math um, district curriculum leader in our PLCs. We continue to offer um, a plethora of professional development. This year we had Carolina Science uh, blocks uh, focused on our new two new strands in each grade level. So we have PD and math, math at the school level. Again, Maggie McGinty and Kathy Lazard have joined us and provided some great PD and math. At the district level in January, Graham Fletcher came and showed us about three act tasks. And for social and emotional learning, at the building level, we have uh, Jen Matthews, Jocelyn Wesson, Cheryl Miller, and Deb Parsons providing opportunities within academic extension around social and emotional learning. We've also worked with Jessica Minahan and Dr. Jerry Schultz. And our academic extension happens during when our teachers go to their professional learning community. Children are engaged in academic extensions aligned to the curriculum in the areas of math, technology, music, social and emotional learning, keyboarding, and library. Mm -hmm. And that's rotated on a six to seven week um, cycle. So each student gets every, every one of those that I mentioned. For our student support goal, we, um, again, we have our grade level professional learning communities that's embedded into the master schedule and they meet weekly. We've aligned our practices and documents with the three elementary schools over the past two years uh, that we utilize in our building based support teams. <coughs> we work with curriculum leaders to, leaders to continue to align standards um, to district curriculum. We've worked um, we really welcome Helene uh, Desjardins, our new team leader, um, into our meetings. And our new BCBA, Jacob DuPont, has been um, really essential uh, to providing support and guidance, both to staff and students, as well as our new uh, assistant sped director, Erica Edstrom. So great additions to our, uh, to our software team. Continue to collect and analyze data across content areas and for our open circle this year we sent Marion Salter, <coughs> our open circle uh, coordinator, to training for the updated curriculum so she's been able to bring that back to staff meetings and into classrooms. We continue to utilize social thinking as well as responsive classroom. And 
for our comprehensive learning environment for 21st century learners. We have a new laboratory lab this year, and I'll speak more to that. That's a 90-minute lesson that all students engage in on a weekly basis. We continue a professional development during staff meetings, in-class support, and during laboratory. We've greatly expanded our use of Google Docs, uh, Google Classroom, Team Drives, and Chrome extensions. Uh, and just the ability to view multiple calendars and team drives have really helped us to be more effective in our planning and our schedule. And then we work at a district level and school level uh, to continuously review what our technology needs are, uh, especially coming up with NCAS this year. We'll be testing grades four and five on the same day, which is fantastic because we don't typically we we do it on different days and it disrupts everyone's schedule so we're super excited to be able to offer that this year right. so moving on to our new um, school improvement plan for 2018 this first goal is going to be a shared goal k through five and Stephen clayton and i worked together to to craft this and I'm sure when Mr. Uh, Principal Lavoy developed his uh, next year that he will um, consider something to this to explore for next year. So the Gary School will support children in acquiring the skills necessary to recognize and manage their emotions, demonstrate empathy for others, establish positive relationships, make responsible decisions, and constructively navigate challenging situ social situations your social curricula and best instruction practices. And this uh, directly aligns to Vision 2020 focus area, um, student support services indicator one. Okay. So um, some of the focus areas and actual processes include forming a pre-K through 18. So that would be a team uh, to represent a cross section of faculty to investigate research-based curricula approaches, strategies that will work together to identify a unified plan across the schools. And we hope to uh, organize that in September or maybe through a summer proposal. Yeah. Um, professional development, continue to offer professional development and skill building for staff aligned to our mission statement as well as to stay focused on the competencies defined by CASEL, which is a collaborative a a collaboration for academic, social, and emotional learning. And that uh, includes self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. And program uh, areas includes open circle, zones of regulation, social thinking, and responsive classroom. And we will continue to partner with organizations. Our existing ones are self of course, SOS, our self Organization for Schools, self Education Foundation, self Senior Center, and self Youth and Family. And we are also hoping to bring on board um, a visit from Mark and Dr. Elizabeth England, Englander from Bridgewater uh, University, as well as continuous um, mindfulness training for both staff and students. And then uh, provide multi-tiered supports for students to prevent social, social and emotional issues from intensifying or becoming chronic, so being proactive rather than reactive. And that includes in-class lessons during academic extension, uh, response to instruction, and social skills curriculum uh, developed by Cheryl Miller that's in our team drive that uh, staff can access and that she provides training for. Uh, we continue, we'll continue to use common languages, common language and practices, and giving students the tools and strategies that they can utilize. So a couple of photos, so this is uh, our Choose Kind photo at the beginning of the year. So that's our entire school staff and students. It was quite a feat getting 
uh, almost 280 people together to create this, but it was a, a collaborative effort. Mr. Lang was on the roof of the school taking it, so it was that we're proud of this picture. This is a theme throughout the school, throw kindness like confetti. And we, um, we, we want to be a part of each student's lives with life. We know that they bring stories with them as they enter into Neary and continue on the journey, the, the two years they're with us. So it's really important for us to get to know each individual student and, and, and accept them for where they're at when we enter into Neary. So goal two is uh, Mary students will demonstrate growth across all academic disciplines, including math, ELA, social studies, science, technology, and engineering. And growth will be measured on multiple measures, in multiple measures, including informal assessments, formative and summative curriculum line, common assessments, as well as MCAS performance. And this aligns to Vision 2020's focus area of curriculum indicator four. And we will continue um, by expanding our use of student progress data, uh, by engaging in evidence-informed decision-making, um, using uh, data analysis protocols. Many of us are uh, taking the DataWise course offered through Harvard. It's an online experience, and so we're using, we'll be using those protocols, and we'll continue to expand in our grade-level work um, and, and uh, how we approach our MCAS data analysis with the shift to 2.0. And um, our collaboration meetings will, will be in, essential to what we do, uh, particularly in the areas of writing and math. And we will uh, continue to work with um, those with expertise, Kathy Lazat and um, Megan McGinsey, as well as our reading specialists in the writing area and in technology. We'll continue to offer rich experiences. Uh, the 90 minute block of the laboratory has been offered to us. We've been able to do it because of a generous grant from SCF this year. So this is a 90 minute block where students come and engage in stream activities. So that's science, technology, research, um, engineering, art, and math. So it's a combination of our librarian and our tech specialists, and they've come together to create incredible um, projects and work that students are doing, uh, such as breakout EDU, uh, coding, 3D printing, cross-content cross project-based learning, uh, solving a real-life problem, so it's been incredible. So if you ever want to come look at this, please, our, door, our doors are open. It's, it's, it's really neat. I actually have, Steve, if you want pass it over. This tells a little bit more about the laboratory. And here's some uh, pictures. Here's our, our teachers working with, uh, this, is, this was the Graham Fletcher professional development engaging um, in the learning. And these are some of our protocols that we're utilizing. This was during a math PD with Kathy Lazat. Our wonder, our noticings and wonderings and putting uh, a plan of action into place and next steps for us as a school. And here we are, this is Graham Fletcher again. And here's some of our laboratory work. So this <coughs> is, um, this is a Lego, Dot motion, it's called. So that's one of the um, one of the activities they engage in. We we participated in an hour of code. We're also working with bit boxes and engineering. I think they were. This was they were building a catapult, I believe, here. So in order to keep it growing, this is what we will need. Of course, district support, administrative support, SEF and SOS support, as uh, well as wraparound support, and continuous review and reflection. <coughs> and this would not have been um, 
<coughs> we wouldn't have been able to accomplish this without our Neary School Council and our staff. So we're excited for our new school group of them. Questions? Comments? I guess I have a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, what? Uh, I'd like to hear a little more about technology. Um, you know, now that you've been one to one with kids for a little while, mm -hmm. can you talk a little about you know what that's meant and how it's been incorporated in the classroom, and especially with respect to differentiated learning? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, um, I mean, so we are one to one, and it's iPads, Chromebooks. Um, laptops and the reason we were able to move towards this experience a laboratory experience was because over the course of the past four years our technology specialist Amy Bruce has gotten into the classrooms worked with the students and staff so it was a shared uh, special subject so staff was learning along with the students and now that they are at a level of proficiency they can take that over and Amy's been able to expand the technology within the laboratory. So as far as differentiated instruction, um, we're able to create small groups. The teachers are able to create small groups, whether maybe it's perhaps it's math, and be able to differentiate those experiences within those small groups or, or writing or during our RTI blocks, so that's our response to instruction blocks, we're able to utilize different programs, um, different apps, app smashing, but it's all designed to what, where the learner is and how we can best meet their needs and move them forward. So it's, it's, we're so fortunate to have it. And when I first came on board four years ago, you know, I was, I didn't know a whole lot. Of, I had never been in a school that had one-to-one, -one, and just to watch the growth over the past four years, so the students, they're, they're the natives, so they, they're coming forward with so much more than we are, and being the immigrants, we've had to learn with them, and we are in a great place right now to be able to have the teachers lead the technology <coughs> learning within the classroom. Of course, Amy is still available, and she does come in and support, but it's really, um, it's really been put in the hands of the teachers so that we could soar with this other opportunity that we're, we're building the plane while flying it with the laboratory because the curriculum ha has <coughs> to be built along with it. So. Yeah. so would you say it's routine now for um, these small groups to be in place in any given classroom? Oh, absolutely. If you were to walk through our hallway, the moment our students walk in in the morning, they're taking out their iPad or they're taking out their Chromebook and, and beginning their learning. That's not to say the teacher you know, isn't engaged with them. They're just routine and they know what to do. And so when a teacher pushes out something on Google Classroom, she can differentiate that. Everybody looks like they're working on the same project or same having the same work in front of them but really it's differentiated for each student. Uh, I had spoken about the, the individual goals, so the, particularly in the area of reading, we're able to push out certain um, reading selections based on the student's reading level. So three times each year, we'll assess students on their reading level, and depending where they're at, we'll identify the books that are appropriate while providing choice to them but it's everybody's reading on their iPad or their Chromebook and it doesn't look different as opposed to everybody having a different book and seeing what each each one's reading. So it's really it's really been wonderful. That's great to hear, because that's yeah. you know, sort of the exact the vision that we had in mind I think when we started on this effort yeah, you know, it's, years ago. But, it's so that's really, great. It, and it's it's that way because the teachers have just embraced it and really um, providing great opportunities for students. That's great. The laboratory, is that sort of, every, the they go together as a class? So they go two classes at a time. Okay. So there's about 40, 38 students in each time, and it's a 90 minute block. And it's, so that builds the collaboration opportunities within it. What's also nice about that block is, so 45 minutes of the 
it's, it's the specialist time, but the additional 45 minutes has allowed Amy and Lisa to expand the projects and really delve into research or whatever the <coughs> curriculum is, whatever they're working on over those six to seven weeks. And that additional 45 minutes embedded into that has provided opportunities for teachers to be able to go into other classrooms and, and observe and then have those meetings where they can debrief and talk about what they've learned. They've been able to view best practices in other classrooms that typically teachers don't get to do. They, there might be 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, but it's provided other opportunities as well for, for teachers and the students just having that 90 minute block has just allowed them to continue the learning without stopping after 45 minutes. 45 minutes is long, but 90 minutes is just a gift. Mm -hmm. And is it every week? Once a week. Once a week. Mm -hmm. And we're piloting what, where we're seven and seven. We're piloting a fourth and fifth grade team together, and it's in group. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. how, how did you build that into the schedule, 90 minute block? Very careful. <laughs> um, it was. It took a lot of rearranging because we also want to make sure that we provide our teachers with common planning time. So it took some. It took some work, but we were able to do it, and we weren't. We didn't have to let anything, anything go. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was great. Thanks. Um, next on our agenda of new business is start time discussion. Well, I think start time is a new business item for our school committee here at the K-8 level uh, in South Grove, but it's certainly a familiar conversation that we've had um, when we've gathered together at our combined meetings. Right. And um, it's a familiar discussion that we've had within our communities. Um, about four years ago, five years ago, um, we really responded to inquiries uh, that um, came our way through conversations that students and parents and administrators were having <coughs> to re-examine uh, the start time, particularly at the high school level. And um, here in Southboro, actually, at Trotty, we had a an outstanding presentation by Dr. Judith Owen, who is um, well-renowned and expert in the field of the impact of sleep deprivation in adolescence. And so since that original conversation, the topic, uh, not to use them, um, but it, it's continued to grow and blossom to take a springboard off of Kathy's presentation, but it, it certainly has. And we continue to explore what our options are in terms of um, not only just moving maybe the time that our high school students begin their day, but the impact and the effects of that change on our K-8s, um, our two-member communities. Uh, we do operate on a three-tiered bus structure, and while um, the busing should not be the first consideration, if in fact uh, moving the time of uh, the beginning of school um, is and provides benefits to our students, but in the reality of our world, it has a significant impact we tear off of the high school route. And so um, trying to examine multiple options that would allow us to um, continue to support the current time schedule that we have here in our North Bro in Southboro, but also in our Northboro communities. So it's been a little bit of a challenge. There are some districts in Massachusetts who have been successful in, um, in moving the time of day. And, um, with a regional school system, it's far more complex because uh, we have things like regional transportation reimbursement. We have something um, in the order of 42, 44 buses, and they um, drop off at 10 different schools uh, with a, quite a geographic distance. And in fact, that's why the whole notion of regional transportation um, was put on the table years and years ago when the Commonwealth was encouraging regionalization. They appreciated that the geographic uh, proximity of the schools was not um, like a single community with three or four schools. And in fact, to travel from one end of one community to the other is a, fair, a fairly significant di distance. So we've had a number of presentations. And 
on our website, on the district website under our district, there is actually a, um, a link for school uh, start resources and uh, there is a summary of the kinds of things that we've investigated and have explored um, over the last several years uh, in terms of modifying ta start times and, and looking at various scheduling options. And so um, the conversation really hasn't taken place at the K-8 level in Southboro. And while, again, the focus primarily has been on adolescents, um, it will have an impact uh, to some extent. We don't know what that would be. I'm assuming uh, we're always going for positive impact, so potentially a positive impact on K-8. And um, the challenge still does become uh, how do we get all of our students to school at a time that's best for them. And um, we've had surveys and um, actu actually I surveyed our high school students uh, four years ago and um, their uh, response was yes, uh, that's important to us, what time we start our day, but uh, we also are stressed, have too much homework, and we love our technology. So um, all of those things they identified as also uh, factors in their day-to-day -day lives. And so knowing that and taking the wisdom from our own students, we um, launched our speaker series by starting out with a presentation in both technology and um, sleep, the effects of sleep on the circadian rhythm of our high school students. And also, um, I think we had stress that year, we had a presentation on stress, just to make sure that we provided um, some educational information to our parent communities about all the topics. So where we are now is, to con is continuing to explore what our no-cost options are. Um, a bus is about $77,000, and um, estimates are to move the high school any significant amount of time, which significant is depending on um, the resource we use, but it's somewhere between 20 and 45 minutes would be considered, or an hour. Um, would involve almost 15 to 16 buses for one community or the other. And so we continue to be innovative and explore um, creative scheduling options at the high school that would allow the school some flexibility, our students some flexibility, while providing equity of access to choice of time to start. Um, and I, I commend Kathleen um, for a principal to take on any scheduling challenge, and challenge is a, is a Yeoman's work, and when it works so well as it as it has at Mary, it's really something to celebrate. It to to your question, um, Paul, it, it isn't an easy feat. Um, it sounds like it was, but tremendous, tremendous amount of work of work. So I applaud the fact that not only one initiative did you embed in a new schedule, but several, all designed for student growth and achievement, uh, which is just tremendous. And so we have sort of that mindset now at the high school while we're exploring our start options. Let's explore all of the things that we want to address, not just moving the hands of the clock, but also providing us with some other options. So I think that one of the reasons we wanted to bring this forward is just so that the community members here in Southboro had an opportunity to hear about those conversations and to maybe visit the website and um, you know travel through all of the resources and information that we have available there. Uh, there is no... Uh, immediate response to this issue. It, it will continue to be discussed and um, we have a member of our high school staff who also is a school committee member at Wachusett Regional and um, she has also researched this topic as part of the doctoral program and she will be presenting some findings at our combined meeting March, Wednesday, March 21st. And so um, presentation will be exciting and the conversation will continue. But it's just something, so it's an awareness uh, for our community members here. I know that our school committee members are familiar with this topic because uh, you've been a, mem a part of the combined meetings when this has been discussed. And uh, it takes time yeah. to be innovative and to do it right. So uh, actually I, I should have uh, I wanted to add after uh, Kathleen's answer to Paul's question of how she managed to work in a 90-minute uh, time period. And I think 
think you said carefully. <laughs> but I'm, I think I'm pretty confident it was also done skillfully. And I just wanted to, you know, acknowledge that. Um, we are um, aware, back to <coughs> start time, that our region with the three districts is a more um, complex issue to try to deal with than, for example, a single district. Um, and the issue of transportation always comes up as certainly, understandably, one of the things that makes it more complex. Other than the, the transportation, which is not the trivial mm -hmm. issue, um, is there anything else that really jumps out uh, as a result of the multi-district region um, in trying to deal with this issue? Is it primarily the difficult issue of the transportation? I think there are a lot of subsets to the conversation. I mean, it depends, I think, what we do. Uh, there are the details in whatever we decide to implement. Uh, there are discussions with our teachers. There are some implications around you know, collective bargaining and what the day might look like. Depending on each group, um, parents, age group, parents have uh, specific concerns. What about after school programs? And what about uh, my child getting home in the dark and late at night? And what about the students leaving too early? And so those are very personal kinds of questions and concerns that people have. But in terms of logistics, what is the most costly logistical change? It would be the transportation. What is the most significant impact Let's say, from a budgetary standpoint, it would be the transportation issue. Okay, I mean, those other, well, you know, the other couple issues you, you mentioned, for example, getting home, I mean, you know, a, a, just a, a single district system with different mm -hmm. age schools is going to deal with those also. They have that, they have that same issue. They're not on the buses. They're anymore. not they on just, the buses. Anymore. They just don't have the, right. the distance. Yeah, the distance. The, the transportation. And the schools are in greater proximity to one another than we have, actually. And so I can think of a district that moved um, their start time at the high school a half an hour, and they were able to coordinate their runs so that the other schools did not necessarily have to change a half an hour. Some of them have decided to have the middle school students ride with the high school students, and they've been able to make that change. Successfully? Um, we don't know yet. I guess that will, ta will be uh, something to follow, um, but it's a challenge. Um, so we're exploring, we've been involved in multiple conversations with our bus uh, company, and we're trying a couple uh, new things this year in terms of how we're going to um, schedule our transportation runs to see if we can capture some, some minutes, because it is down to minutes between um, drop-off points at schools, so we've been analyzing that more closely, so that we could mitigate any um, time that we may move the high school and its impact on the elementary schools, to see if we could, if we move 30 minutes, can we find 15 in between by doing some other kinds of things so that the impact on the elementary schools and the middle schools would only be 15 minutes. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm delighted that you noted that it's it has to be very thoughtful, very mindful, very collaborative. Um, and with whatever we do, proper notification so that all families could, could adjust. Um, for the little ones, it's extended day, whether it's extended day in the morning or extended day in the afternoon. And so are all these logistical and family kinds of concerns, um, are they potentially something that can be addressed? Yes, but it, it, it has to be with thought with notification and all of these providers would need to adjust their schedules as well. We have a very vibrant extended day program in South Row um, and you know students are everywhere and that's something that um, our students enjoy and that our parents depend on. So making sure that our providers and our communities are aware. And there was a lot of concern you know early on about athletics and certainly the middle schools have after school athletic programs as well what is the impact of that on athletics and um, that concern has been somewhat mitigated in the research that we've you know and negated in the research that we've done um, in terms of how it really does impact uh, not only um, 
practice time, but competition. So there are a lot of elements, but in terms of the, the actual financial impact, it is the transportation piece. And so many intangibles. And so is the way, is the way it would go is that the committee for the high school pretty much comes up with what they think might work, and then we start talking about how that would impact the schools here? And I think that... Um, are they looking at that as well, or how does that all... I think one of the things that has been true throughout this conversation is that we are a community of learners. And so to talk about this in isolation, to think about it as only a high school issue, um, is not how we, we collaborate and work together as a community. And while we're two communities, we're, we, we, as we say, one community of learners. And so um, we've been very appreciative of the fact that any change that occurs at the high school, even if it's just an older sibling not getting home in time to watch the younger um, members of the family, um, has to be done in, with a common thought and, a con and, and all sharing in that conversation. So we've tried to bring this as often as possible to the combined meeting where our K-8s are present along with you know, the high school staff. And I think that has been our purposeful intent uh, to not leave anyone out of the conversation because you know, um, it's important for us to work together on this topic. Yeah. Well, I think it is a really good thing to start thinking about because it sounds like if, if the option of getting just high school buses is not on the table, we're gonna just be shifting things, then necessarily mm -hmm. things will be changing to some degree with the elementary schools right. if the high school time changes. So. When we first discussed this about four years ago, um, or it seems a little bit longer than that, the, um, the whole notion was that this was an opportunity to really look at what we do very differently and not just to make this about the hands of the clock that this is an opportunity to embrace 21st century learning environment that's, that um, is flexible, that expands the day, not just because of minutes, but expands the learning opportunities for students. And um, I'm hopeful that that sort of innovating, innovative mindset and thinking is what drives the conversation and not minutes. Um, since we've began the conversation, since we've begun the conversation, the you know acceptable amount of time that we should move seems to be moving and so if we get closer to 10 it should be 20 and if it's 20 it should be 30 and and then when we started the conversation it was just high school and then as more and more research became available to us and more conversations taking place about this topic which is very important and it's an important conversation uh, for us to all engage in and learn more about um, the issue then became middle school as well, the youngest of our adolescent population, and that they in fact then would benefit from a later start. So it's, you know, it's, it's been um, an expanded conversation at all grade levels. Um, there have been, I think that, I don't know the latest um, statistic, but there are about 351 cities and towns um, in the in the Commonwealth and we are 13 members of our collaborative and when I, I think Neshoba moved there is about five to ten minutes and um, Shrewsbury has been exploring this for probably off and on it's not necessarily a new topic but it sort of comes in it way it comes and goes um, Shrewsbury has been exploring this a couple times over the last 15 years um, and it's something that all the schools are looking at, but very few have successfully been able to find the right answer. So I'm sure this will continue. What did you say the figure was on the buses if you were going to add a course of buses to the high school? So the, we've probably had six, seven, maybe eight scenarios over the years. And every time we've, we've completed one more potential routing of our students, we realize that if we don't tear off of the high school and try to do a single run, um, with the 40 odd buses, and this isn't factoring any of our late buses as well, which we are very fortunate to enjoy having, um, it really does support our, our students' lives, at learning, and uh, their activities as well. Um, we have about 40 buses. I think there were about 30 um, 
18 or 19 in Northboro and the remaining buses allocated to Southboro. Um, we're exploring tightening up our bus uh, stops. Right now, we, our buses stop where there's a student. Um, and so every time the bus stops, it's about a minute plus. And with the, young, the younger ones, it's even more. Um, they forget their lunch and there's one more hug to be had and those kinds of things. So, um, you know, that's a significant amount. Um, and so um, I think as we, we look at the buses, we're talking about at least 15. That's the lowest number that we've talked about in any one community. And that would be starting another tier. Um, we've so looked at. Just for mm -hmm. and, and we've looked like at. 79,000 per bus. 70, 75,000. Yeah, 75. So we've looked at um, you know, flipping the runs. And the problem with that is if the high school isn't the first start, we actually lose minutes because the younger the children get, the more minutes it stops. And so the longer the routes become. And, um, and so that's been a challenge, but we've looked at, you know, the elementary schools in the middle, a couple of elementary schools starting, you know, early, but the earliest run would still be starting at around quarter or seven, 6.30. So um, I, I wanna commend our, our NRT. We've gone back to them many times. They're very creative. Um, this year, we're actually going to try something new. Um, we're going to give NRT all of our bus data in March and ask them to do a dry run. Uh, this year they will be doing 90% of our bus transportation routing and so we want to see if we could, um, how that will impact the start of school if we're able to work out all the glitches and um, to analyze whether or not through their work and through um, doing some creative either uh, consolidating stops or um, unloading our students earlier and having someone there to, to be watchful over them because, and then they can disembark earlier, we actually pick up some minutes. Um, and then when you have construction like we'll have in South Grove, um, we're gonna have some, I'm sure a lot of conversations with the, um, the folks who are planning the Main Street project and then the public safety because there's one road in and there's one road out. And our schools are located at both, both, uh, on both of those routes. So um, that will be just an adventure in terms of you know, making sure our routes are ready for our kids and so forth. So. Has there been discussion about, this just occurred to me and I'm new to this <laughs> conversation, so <laughs> bear with me, but what about consolidating the, the pickups and drop-offs for Neary and Trottier? Because the, the drop-off is practically the same location, so then pick up all those kids on the same route, or does that take too long? Do you know what I mean? Like, that might say, anyway, that's probably an idea for a different conversation. We, we are listening sure to all suggestions, <laughs> and, um, because you know, good. there might be one magic uh, routing assist, uh, combination that we, the bus company hasn't taken a look at yet, but it is, it is a challenge. Um, there have been, again, some uh, Duxbury was successful several years ago. Uh, Sharon has changed, but the number of schools in their community are minimal, and, and they are in close proximity. You know, like you know, when I was school, we had a K through eight school, so you could stop yeah. at a bus stop and right, right. put everybody on a bus, and then you could get them off on a bus. And K through eight for us is four schools. Yeah. You know, it's four different drop offs and pickups. So and we have Route Nine, and we have Route, route Twenty, yes. and we have Four Ninety Five. And in any given day, that can be a challenge in and of itself yeah. without even talking about start time. Exactly. So I, I think it's an important conversation um, because it, it could potentially benefit all of our students um, in some way. Um, I'm hopeful that when we, we come back to this conversation, it's about um, innovative approaches to what we do during the course of the day. And that's really where we started this conversation four years ago considering, you know, schedule changes and flex blocks and things like that at the high school level. All right. All right. Uh, next on our agenda, legislative update. We all have our yellow legislative bulletins from the MASC. Anybody reading this one? I have thought. <laughs> okay. you know, we have a meeting um, coming up with 
Carol Dykemer and whatever other legislators she manages to, to pull in. I think it's March 13th. I believe so. <coughs> so I thought it would be a good idea to sort of get in sync on issues we want to bring up there. I think it's the same ones we've been dealing with several years. Yeah. And it's well, the circuit right with the circuit right. Oh yeah. yeah. There's a flurry of um, invitations to legislative breakfasts. Uh, I actually have one from Senator Markey's office um, inviting all of our school committee members to a town hall nonpartisan legislative update on February 18th at 3 to 5 p.m. at the Memorial Building in um, Framingham on Concord Street. And if you haven't received your invitation from Senator Markey, I believe it might be on its way to you, or you just had it delivered live from his office to you. It's really good. Um, and just yesterday, um, Mr. Martin and I, no, and I traveled to the Shoba Tech, where uh, MARS, which is the Massachusetts Association of Regional Schools, is also sponsoring a, a legislative breakfast in March. Um, invitation extended to any school committee member who would like to attend that as well. Um, I have the um, March 12th, I think. I can send out the date. It goes somewhere every day. And our quarter nine chamber had a legislative breakfast as well. So there's a lot of breakfast to a be lot had. Of free food. <laughs> and a lot of discussions. Uh, we actually um, were present yesterday and the um, Mass Budget Policy Committee was present and they gave us basically the non-Department of Ed version of what the budget was going through and where the actual money might be found. And it's always a delightful presentation because it is not an educational presentation from the Department of Ed or the Department of Revenue. It's, you know, sort of a bipartisan, um, non, non uh, judgmental look at what the budgetary landscape is this year. And uh, tonight we're going to look at our recommended budget. And what's interesting is we are up here in the process. And we're in the very first block, and there are seven more blocks to go around. Um, and before we're hoping July 1, we'll have a final budget. But it's not uncommon for us to receive final numbers um, in August. And uh, we're hoping that they move this along so that the budget we pass tonight will actually be supported by the Chapter 70 they say we might receive. Mm -hmm. and the circuit breaker. Yeah, and the circuit breaker conversation, I think that was the most enlightening. It was actually the presenter from the Mass Budget Policy. And basically he said, you know, we know there's a lot of people out there looking for more money from Circuit Breaker. It was reduced to 65% as opposed to the 75%. But until the extraordinary relief available dollars are calculated, and until March 31st, when districts have an opportunity to apply for extraordinary relief, and not every district does because they don't hit the benchmark, they won't be able to make too many decisions about circuit breaker. So that moves us to April, because the extraordinary relief calculations are due March 31st. And for probably the two people at the Department of Ed that will be reviewing <coughs> all of those what does an extraordinary relief have to do with circuit breaker? Well, it's an act, actually it's an extraordinary event for us when we're eligible. It means that our costs, and I know Matt's listening, so I'll, he can chime in if I miss a beat here. Um, our special ed costs would have had to exceed 125 percent of the previous year's benchmark to ordinary to actually qualify for any additional funding. So I actually had a conversation with um, Sandy additional, today. Additional to what? Expenditures. For special Additional ed over the breaker? previous year, no, special ed. No, but our special ed was 125% of what it That's was. That's what it is. So then yeah. we get more circuit breaker. We get or extraordinary we relief. relief aid. 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 And that aid, aid will come probably, if we're eligible, in April. And it had to, has to be fully expended by June 30th. But wait, <clears throat> extraordinary relief aside. I mean, we definitely lost money when the circuit breaker That's went correct. from 75 to 65, right? So to me, it's two different discussions. 
It isn't, Destroy except they country. blended it. <laughs> so they basically they said, you're not going to get, we're not going to be able to tell you if you're going to get your 75% back, which everybody should have gotten, and they decided to cut. Right. Stop right there. Until, but this is what they're telling us, until they get all the money. It is two different discussions, but they've combined it into one okay. pot of well, money. I think we need to tell them, you should be combining these. I mean, taking money away from special needs, I mean, of all things, I don't know how you sleep at night doing that. Green. Well, because you just took, really took money away from regular ed because we can't cut special ed because well, it's yeah. mandated. So. But it's just, I mean, to me it's an easy thing to go to the legislature and say, look what you're doing here. I mean, and, and how can you not be able to make a case for not cutting special ed? If you can't do that, you know, go right. home. I think that the point that I think with the presentation yesterday, it was the first time someone basically actually said, look, I know everybody's wanting this number to go back to 75%, but here's how it really works. Right. It but really works because year, once what, we get the start, next year? you know, that's, I thought that was an honest right. and enlightening response because yeah. it doesn't mean we should be asking. I mean, yeah, for that's how they're saying it works, right. but let's face it, there's a yeah. pool of money, they can take it from anywhere, real. But what the, what the problem is, right, um, we, we, you know, as, as, as we agree, how can you not fund that, right? But because it really is an unfunded mandate in a lot of ways, they know it's going to get funded on somebody else's back. Here we are. Uh -huh. Okay. So. It's a mandate, so we have to. Well, I, I guess yeah. what I'm saying is, so it's, unfair. Cut, should, it's, it's unfair. It's unfair. It's, it's, it's unfair. Really but really we should be vocal, to, you know, Absolutely. about what they're doing. Absolutely. Put it out in the daylight and, and see what people think. I mean, I'm mad, obviously. Yeah. Didn't and show I think it all. <laughs> <laughs> Did it well. I mean, it should be 100%. Yeah. So to the idea that kind of 75 or 65 is abhorrent to me. We, we, what does that have to do with next? Because we're not talking about next year's budget. So they're just kind of try, trying to see how much. Or are we trying to see if they're going to back fund the 10% that they cut this year? Has to do with things, okay. And but what is in the budget for starting June one for next year? Sixty-five. That, that's still at sixty-five percent. But we are. Okay. That's the problem. Right. Like, if you have a one-year blip, and now they're talking right. about these extra funds, that's the one issue. And I agree with Paul; they should be two separate things. But the more important issue, we even even bump down that is, what do they got in there for next year, and get that back? Sixty-five. To Right. So it's two issues. But we are talking about next year regarding this extraordinary yeah. this extraordinary expense or you know if, if you're if you're one hundred and twenty five percent over mm -hmm. which we hear about in April that happens and you have every to spend year. it by right. June, right? Mm -hmm. so That's this year. Right. Yeah, that's special, right. And I think that all of this is true. And it is even more true for those districts who um, are spending the receipts in the year that they receive right. them in. Mm -hmm. right. we, we bank our receipts so that that allows us to be, uh, to, to react to these kinds of last minute um, difficult reductions uh, right. that come our way with no notice. And so there are many districts who fully expend their special ed the day they receive it. And so their budgets were built on this. And with special ed being a significant portion of everyone's operational budget, that is a significant amount of money, a substantial amount of money. And in order to meet the deficit, uh, that requires cuts from some portion of the budget. And, and, and layoffs and reductions in force and cutting of services and supplies and technology with no notice to the districts with budgets that have already been well set and approved uh, the year prior. And so we see that with Circuit Breaker, we see that with regional transportation, um, that our budgets, we just talked about how we benefit from that as a, to, as a K-8 um, because of our multi-tiered structure. Those transportation budgets were part of the agreement to regionalize and have never been above 70 except for once that I know of in seven years. And so the, those are be built into the base of the, of the operational budget. Um, and 
you know, there's so many facets of the circuit breaker language, which is no reimbursement for transportation. In some cases, the transportation costs are as significant um, as the placement. And there's no reimbursement. That doesn't factor into anything, whether it's extraordinary <coughs> relief or circuit breaker. It just doesn't count. So um, this is something that comes up each and every year. Okay. Well, we'll get, get all the official notices on all the breakfasts. And, and we've sent letters. letters. Uh, everyone, right. the school committee has been very proactive with that, as have the other two school committees. And I know, uh, Paul, there are some bills moving forward already. Uh, it's it's uh, disheartening to sit um, and, and hear that, you know, the, all of this funding is coming our way. And in reality, the amount of Chapter 70 increase that we've received is maybe $30,000. Um, and the amount of per pupil expenditure is, is, wasn't significant. And so to say we've spent more money on public education is sort of, yes, that's true, because it's never cost so much money. So it's easy to say we've spent more money. I mean, that's just a common sense approach to that, but it sells well. That might cover transportation for one child, maybe, you know. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying maybe. maybe. It's half a bus, it might yeah, be a yeah. van. I don't yeah. think it's gonna be a full bus. Yeah, there's plenty of buses. <laughs> okay. All right, All right. so we're on to old business. Um, and we are going to have an update from Kathleen on our K through eight world language study group, which yeah. has met. We have. I met in uh, the end of January, and we broke up into. So we now have three subcommittees. Uh, one that's exploring types of programs K through five. One that's that is exploring trends and benefits in world language education, and one that's exploring how uh, we're changing the scope of K-5 to benefit middle and high school. So our next steps, uh, Rota Web is exploring visits to other districts that offer various types of programming. And each of the subcommittees is working on their um, special, special area. And we have a team drive, so people are putting their research and findings into each of their folders. And our next meeting will be March 21st. So we're off to a really good start. There's 10 of us, and, and we're all excited to be part of this committee. I just throw out there, I was there. It was, it was a really great meeting, lots of positive contributions. And Good call. Well, good good, good yeah. mix of yeah. people. Yeah, mix. Yeah. yeah, it was really good. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'll look forward to hearing more. <coughs> and that was um, actually uh, a question posed to us at our financial advisory meeting mm -hmm. uh, from the um, South Pro Financial team. What were we doing about world language? And so we had an opportunity to say, well, there's 10 wonderful folks who are going to provide us that answer sometime yeah. down the road. I so very excited to hear that. See, we felt that there was enthusiasm. It was nice to see the mm -hmm. enthusiasm from people outside of just our committee saying, oh, we're glad you're exploring that. Mm -hmm. So it was a pleasant, pleasant mm -hmm. resource. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, all right, next is kindergarten transition update. Equally exciting uh, is our uh, progress on transitioning to a tuition-free full-day kindergarten model. This is, will be our second year. It seems like it should be our fifth or sixth, but I think we've been talking about it for two or three, which again speaks to um, good planning and a lot of um, input along the way. And with this budget uh, that you'll see this evening, the recommended budget, uh, the proposal is to continue to um, transition to operational budget. If approved, we will be 83 percent, <coughs> excuse me, of the total cost of uh, our kindergarten program on operational budget in the second year with the hopes that depending on what the budget landscape is like as we begin to discuss FY20 in September, um, that we'll be able to move to a free, full, complete um, tuition-free full-day program uh, to be able to have made such progress in in the two years and to be able to sort of stay on track with our goals and our vision is um, pretty exciting. Good. All right. Next 
on our list of old business is the Municipal Technology Committee update. And I know Steve <coughs> and Paul have been actively involved in this. Mr. Desmond was the chair. He was. <coughs> Let me Would take you? this? Sure. Well, we have uh, the two candidates here today, uh, Peter Albert and William Warren, are the two that the uh, selection subcommittee, I guess we would call, recommended um, be appointed by the school committee. So we're hoping to do that tonight. I think we have some background on each of them. They're here if uh, you want to ask any questions, but uh, I can give you just a little spiel. But uh, Peter was the only candidate I think we had that had any school experience. He's um, He's got experience as both a teacher and uh, he's currently a technical coordinator at the uh, Rotten School, I believe. <coughs> the other gentleman is William Warren and he had some deep technical and project management experience, uh, which I thought was exactly the kind of profile that we wanted on the MTC. He's got experience with Accenture, uh, building systems and looking at new technology, assessing priorities, building consensus around you know, technology <coughs> with different you know, uh, stakeholders. And uh, I wrote in my notes after his interview, this guy would be perfect. <laughs> two perfect candidates. <coughs> so we are appointing two members, one who is going to um, serve a one-year position, right. and a second who is going to um, serve three a three-year position. Yeah. Okay. Well, Peter for the one and William for the three. But because <laughs> since it's starting, we're just trying to get yeah. uh, some kind it's of It's really not even more role. because of Right. Mark Purple suggested that we end it. They, they, all these appointments usually end January 30th because their fiscal starts. <coughs> so we'll be June 30th. back again June 30th. So, okay. so okay. I guess in June we'll you know, reappoint. Re <coughs> gotcha. I just have to comment on the process. Uh, we spent a lot of time discussing that here at the school committee level. And I think thanks to um, a lot of input from a lot of folks, I, I thought the process was outstanding. Mm -hmm. it, it was actually. Um, <coughs> uplifting and um, informative and a wonderful opportunity to be part of this community initiative uh, being seated at the table with the Board of Selectmen, uh, the representative from the Board of Selectmen, the library trustee and um, two, uh, I guess we were ad hoc at the time, Brian Ballantyne <coughs> from the town and um, Ryan Donovan from the library uh, Terry Donovan from Library <coughs> Trust Board of Library Trustees and, and myself and we spent two days uh, one morning and one evening interviewing the applicants and just excited about the kind of knowledge that will be helping to form this new committee and I think that the energy that the folks who will be appointed bring, will bring is uh, really brings to life the intent of the, com the committee. So it was, it, was, it was an enjoyable, we sit on yep. a lot of interview teams and this one was, uh, was exciting. It was it a was great really, group of folks. I mean, all the candidates brought something to the table. Absolutely. And, and I would encourage the MTC to reach out to them, you know, as you're doing your work, because, um, and that's what we told everybody, was that no matter if you're selected or not, you know, there's, there'll be a role for you. Okay. Um, well, it's been, um, it's been uh, I think, acknowledged before since, since Tim is here and um, kind of acknowledge the, uh, the quality effort that Stan all contributed to the process. And I'd like to say again that um, we, we really wouldn't be here without the incredible energy and effort that Tim uh, really gave to this project from the time it was a gleam in, in the old MTC committee's eye to manage to get it to the finish line. Certainly, a lot of other people contributed uh, greatly to getting it done, but um, without Tim, I don't think it would have ever happened. So, uh, kind of right back at you. All right, on that. Um, I have a question. Um, should this be two votes because we have a one year and a three year and handle these votes separately? Is that the way the chair would like to handle this? I probably, and also we should, it might be three votes because we also um, could do an ex officio. Mm -hmm. Correct, you're correct. I was just asking about the actual yes. 
Yeah, so, uh, so probably we should just do, I would say, do seat. motions for each each of them. and then Motion for the discussion. Uh, also, why don't I uh, move that, uh, I guess, move that we appoint Peter Albert to the uh, one-year term or to the uh, Municipal Technology Committee for the one-year term. I guess that's mm -hmm. that separate motions. Second. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Here, good thing. All right. Um, should we vote? All in favor? The motion passes unanimously. Also, like to move that we appoint William Warren to the three-year to the municipal. Technology Committee for the three-year term. Okay. Second. Second. Any discussion? Awesome. Let's vote. All in favor? And now the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Congratulations, guys. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very for much. Looking forward to great things yes. from this committee's appointees. Did we also do our, oh, yeah. do we have to? Well, I, I, yeah, I reached out to the town and I think the Board of Selectmen are going to go, uh, I'm going to revisit the ex officio. Uh, they made the appointment the other night and they forgot about this piece, so we, we're going to try to get it all done tonight. Okay. Um, and then the committee can move on. Okay. So the, the um, bylaws do suggest that the school committee may appoint an, an uh, ex officio to the, ter to the um, MTC and it does not need to necessarily be a resident and so um, Greg and I chatted for some length about who might be the most appropriate member of our district team and um, reached out to this person today and actually his response was you know I've been watching this I was hoping I had an opportunity to participate in this and um, that would be Andy Mariotti who is our district um, technology administrator. And particularly after participating in the interview process and listening to the kinds of questions and the wealth and breadth of knowledge of the applicants, particularly the two who are with us this evening, um, in terms of the kinds of conversations that they would be having about uh, security and and strategic planning and um, infrastructure and networking and telecommunications and uh, fiber optics and and really that would be Andrew. Um, I think we you've, you've um, had an opportunity to meet him. He wasn't available to come this evening. He sends his regrets. Um, but Andy recently presented at the combined meeting at the beginning of the year and gave us a nice overview of what was going on in the, in the district. So um, he has graciously agreed if it is the will of the committee to step into this position. And I think he will be, uh, we feel he'll be a ter tremendous addition to the committee. And would then encourage him to visit us often to give us some updates. What is the term of this appointment? The ex officio, I think, has no term. I think we can probably reappoint, or we can yeah. take it away and change okay. it. So, so we would revisit it. It's at will. We can revisit it anytime time right. choose. As probably he could as well. Right. Yeah, as, as any appointee <laughs> can as well. Right. Don't, don't mention that to the two appointees tonight just yet. If there's anything going on at a particular meeting that someone else mm -hmm. is more appropriate to be at, that's fine too. Right. And I think part of the conversation, Paul, if I can remember correctly, when we looked at the language, is that um, they would be ad hoc opportunities too for members, for people who have yeah. particular knowledge right. on that topic, yeah. right? to be able to also participate. Yeah, we wouldn't have to go through any kind of a process. No. Okay. Um, so if, could we make a motion for sure. that? And I can, he'll be thrilled. Okay. Oh, this, no, that's just his name. Uh, I'll move that uh, the school committee vote to appoint Andrew Mariotti, district network administrator, to represent the district uh, on the MTC. As an official as 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 member. I'll yeah. second that. All right. Um, any discussions? No. Um, all in favor? And that motion passes unanimously. Fantastic. So we are all set.
successful launch. All right. That's good to me. That's great. Um, and last but certainly not least on our old business is um, an update on the public safety building. And we have drawings and pictures. We do. And we're actually going to go live on the big screen. Okay. Good. Because we can figure out how it's to make there. this all work. <laughs> um, and so I'll just bring us up to current time practice with uh, the conversations we've been having. Okay. I'm going to try to shake the computer. Did you put it in the room? And that's Brady. That's my golden retreat. It's not really what the high point is, but there he is anyways, taking a much deserved nap. So let's see if we can actually get the Woodward School up there. Thank you, Brady, for sharing that moment with me. There you go. Not quite Brady, but as equally, as, as equally important. So um, we actually had a wonderful opportunity to meet with the design consultant. It's the same design consultant that's um, working on the project with the um, town. And um, we had asked him to bring some preliminary drawings in. And there's no commitment on any of this. Uh, we did suggest to him that we wanted our school committee to take a look at this and have some discussion about it. Um, so everything is up for conversation to some extent. Um, and so far, uh, we've, had, we've incurred minimal costs on this um, the work, and so that's exciting because uh, we have been committed and we did commit to see the design process through to successful drawings. We were joined at that meeting um, by Gregory uh, Russell, who's the project man manager, but he also is uh, a member of the design consultant team, and Karen Gallivan. So, uh, Steve, I think it was right before our MTC interview, selection yes. committee interviews. We were across the hall and we were right there. Yeah. So, one of the things that we did learn, and, and Steve's going to, I don't know if you want the pointer, sure. Steve, instead, if you want to take center stage and describe your school yep. and the proposal. I do have the basketball court. I'm not sure how that's going to show. <laughs> this became very, very important when we had our meeting. So you'll have to picture this as we're talking about where the basketball court would be, perhaps, through the change. Um, and so one of the things that we did learn, and we were really happy about this, is that um, in the construction um, plans for the new entry point uh, into the public safety building, which is our circular drive, um, the town is planning to put the road in and purchase the gate. So we were very happy to hear that because we thought that might be part of the, the redesign uh, work that they were going to be doing. So the circle stays, uh, but after much um, conversation and letter writing with the planning board, they approved the traffic flow. Uh, one of the concerns was, you know, the backup <coughs> at Woodward and would it back into the safety building and so forth. And so um, we, we were successful in exchanging with uh, Jason Melanowski, who has been wonderful through this, uh, several letters. Um, and the planning board gave us the thumbs up to continue the conversation about this. We're looking at this in, in terms of two phases. Uh, first, the most important is um, cutting that entry point to Woodward from the new public safety facility. And then the second part is, well, now we're, that we're doing this work, let's see if we can improve the overall design and, and, and layout of the parking and, and bus routing at the Woodward School. So, Steve, I'm going to turn this over sure. to you. So, with the entryway coming um, from Corderville up this way, you can't really see it on this uh, depiction, but it would basically come this way through the... Um, public safety building parking area. It would be the gate there that um, Superintendent Johnson referenced. And then buses would come this way and then um, queue right here, right along the curb, and then drop students off to enter into the building. Um, so what this does really is cut down the two-way bus traffic. Currently, this dark line is what we experience. So buses come in here, go around the circle, and then um, park in front of the building. At this point, we also have students who are being dropped off by their parents in the lower lot walking up and then crossing at the crosswalk here with a staff member. Um, that's, posed, that's presented some challenges because you have two-way bus traffic and, and they're walking past vehicles that are parked here. While we have a crosswalk and we do have a staff member, it's, it's um, still a, a dangerous, it could be a dangerous scenario. Um, so with the, uh, the cut-through here, 
it would prevent it would promote one-way bus traffic. They would drop off the students and then exit through um, the current driveway, uh, the, the driveway that we currently have here. Um, another change that Superintendent Johnson referenced was just the additional parking. So here we're picking up, um, I believe we have seven parallel parking spots, but this would be adding um, 19 spaces, so an additional 12. They'd be pull-in spots with a retaining wall and then a, um, a curb and a sidewalk allowing people to cross here at the crosswalk in a safer manner. Right now, we don't have any kind of crosswalk for those parallel spots. So again, on this turn, where you have buses coming in and out of the property, um, that can be pretty hazardous to, to parents, students, as well as staff members. And one of the things about that retaining wall is part of the conversation that we, we had with the design crew was how can we make that a safer walkway for everyone, including the teachers who are you know, <coughs> moving in and out of their cars, and not only that, but from the lower lots as well. And if we can remember about a year ago, um, uh, Karen Galligan, the super department, DPW superintendent, um, spent a little time presenting the Main Street project to us. And at that time, she talked a little bit about a sidewalk that would connect down from the center of town. And so what Steve has just referenced really is connecting into that sidewalk so that it's a very safe passageway for students and it would connect onto that, uh, that sort of low retaining wall with, where we now create more parking but a safe walkway so that the students also then have a safer pathway crossing the campus in the, in the current driveway area now, right? I think? Yes. Right, so right there. And we lose a lot of the, the clustering and I think open up the visibility. Yeah, just this year we actually had a, an accident where a bus was pulling into the property. Um, a car was parked illegally um, in a, a, a designated area. Um, they, their tail end was out a little too far and the bus was leaving, the bus was coming in and it was just um, you know, just bad timing. I mean, it could happen to anyone. So this, um, again, would reduce that two-way traffic for buses, which um, is a huge vis visibility issue. It also we, um, gives us some parking options up above. Yeah, so we pick up 52 traffic. spaces altogether on the property. We pick up 13 right here. Um, in the circle because this would no longer be used for turnaround traffic or bus traffic. Buses would come this way on the circle. So this area here would be additional parking spaces for building staff and administrative staff. Um, we keep the parking spaces all along here, but we could reduce some to create more visibility for students crossing. And then we pick up 19 spots here, mm -hmm. as well as um, I believe it's um, 27 spots in the lower parking area. And none of that dis none of that disrupts the current loading dock, outdoor no, classroom no, space. No, nope, it actually it would actually help the flow for parent drop off in the morning as well. We're talking about some curb here, um, so that would create a more designated, a more defined loop area where parents can come in, drop their students off, and continue on out. Do you want to bring the? You want to, I'm not sure how I can bring the basketball court off. If you just here, jump and hold it, I can up just hold it up. And just so, imagine this uh, superimposed on that diagram. Yeah, so one of the options um, that we're looking at is currently the basketball court is right here. I'm just trying to outline it. We would shift it down to the bottom corner so it would be um, out of the way. Um, it could be used during the school day when we have outdoor recess or the students are in the front of the building using the field. Um, so it would give them um, a safer access to that where we could easily um, have staff members standing on the outside or mark it off with cones. And uh, all of this uh, with some retaining wall material and paint. I think yeah. that was basically what we started to um, investigate what the cost options might be. And I think but that was- But parents are still- Parents are still using the lower lot. They're still- um, I think one of the, the major issues that we wanted to improve was just the two-way bus traffic um, okay. and creating a safer route for students who are getting, getting off of the buses the, the, or, or walking across the, the driveway there. Um, really, one of the issues is it takes a much longer time for, to offload a school bus as it does for a parent to drop off one or two students. So we are worried that if, if this is buses and parents in their vehicles, um, this could create more of a backup. Mm -hmm. And would pickup happen the same way? Because pickup is now the parents park in the lower lot and walk mm -hmm. up and get the kids. And, and I've noticed the buses then too. Yeah, they parking in the lot. lower lot yeah. with um, the one-way traffic and using the crosswalk mm -hmm. there. Yeah. yeah. So it's because I, I, I was hoping, I thought that we might be able to loop everybody because, I mean, what's horrendous when you're trying to come through town is, is the parents coming in and out of that one driveway so close to the light at 85. So is there any way to, there, I mean, anyway. 
we are awaiting results from a traffic study, but I, I don't think we've seen those yet to, uh, to determine if that would help the flow of parent traffic. And one of the concerns from the Public Safety Planning Commission was what is the traffic going to be going through the public safety lots? And so one of the big concerns they had was minimizing and trying to contain what that traffic would look like. Um, and we actually had conversations about who's going to lock the gate and who's going to open the gate and, you know, those kinds of things. So the, um, the ability just for the buses to enter that was something that they were concerned about because it's actually going to be cutting through, you know, one of their lots. And we think right. that it's not going to impede what they need to do because of the timing, um, the time our buses arrive and the time our buses depart. But, um, you know, the notion of us traveling over one another's space is something that, I think both people, both groups felt a little uncomfortable about. Um, so this right now is where the discussions have have gone or have come to, um, and we've asked them to um, hold off going any further in terms of cost estimates or the next revision of what we had just shared with you this evening until um, we gain some additional input. And um, the timetable is ours actually right now in terms of where we go with the design work and, and, um, and additional input from so the committee. Why still keep the circle there? I mean, why not go to green space? Yeah, or just have a straight through. I mean, if that idea. So, so with it paved in its current state, we could pick up additional parking spaces? So that was one reason that, um, that we felt like we could still use the space. Um, okay. Also, the loading dock is that end? Or yeah, the, the loading uh, dock is right there in this, in this kind of uh, behind, the, um, behind the cafeteria area. So it feeds out into the circle. Gotcha. So you still need, we still need off to, hours, you yeah, need a truck to be able to come right, in, to come in back in. and then, yeah. so they're going to, wow. Gotcha. Just, just wondering. <laughs> so if, if, um, we want some uh, wait time to review this more and take some additional comments. Um, we can certainly allow for that, or if we feel that we're ready to have them at least go back and do the next revision and then bring that back to the committee, we can we could move in that direction as well. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think you guys know what I kind of feel like. You, you guys know what's best for the flow here. Like I said, I was hoping we could get those do because to me the congestion at that spot is is if you're there at drop off or pick up, it's people trying to make rights and lefts out of that driveway at such a precarious spot yeah. that. But at least you're going to be cutting the bus traffic. And I cut yeah, there. Well, there was discussion about having it, having people um, enter through the current driveway and traveling through the front of the building and then exiting through that public facility. But then you'd have students exiting the bus, having to walk in front of the mm -hmm. bus, which mm -hmm. we're trying to reduce. Right. Right. So oh, yeah, pushing gotcha. the traffic down farther on 85 was something that was part of the initial discussion. Right. Trying to get it away because yeah. the whole idea is to get it away from right. that light. Right. Um, but maybe once. <laughs> I mean, the, the secondary project of Main Street is, I think, supposed to add a turn lane there, which yeah. could yeah. help, yeah. should help. Yeah. Every little bit does. There doesn't seem to be a reason to hold up. Okay. Yeah. Uh, having them go forward for the next revision. Right. right. And I don't think there is a solution to that problem of the parents <coughs> still having to go in and out like that. And I'm not sure right. that replace drive. Yeah. Right. You know, and, and despite the turnaround there, it does. It does go very smoothly. We've had very few issues in the lower lot where parents come in, drop. You know, it's an active drop off, and then um, exit the facility using the, the current driveway. I oh, yeah, no, I'm talking about me. I'm talking about everyone else who's on 85, and oh. the parents are cutting you off, and you yeah. know you're trying to go straight, and they're they shove out in front of two lanes of traffic, and it's kind of nuts. So, but I think that's just part of part of where the driveway is if we can't fix it. Sure. Great. We'll provide updates as we have them. Yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll reach out to the design firm uh, this week and see if we need another meeting or if they can just take that and put it to paper for us. Okay. Um, all right. Next on our agenda, we have enrollments. 
this is the um, monthly update of our enrollments and our projected enrollments have not significantly changed from our discussion last month. Um, on the flip side, we'll see all of the changes over time. And uh, this year at this point, three changes. And now it's three stable enrollments. Okay. And kindergarten, who knows who will register by the time next September comes. Yeah. Clayton's up to 160. I know Jim used to say 140, so we have to 160 in kindergarten, right? Clayton, is that what you said? Half no 10. Okay. <laughs> right now we're holding steady at 99. So. Yeah. All right. I think you'll have a few more showing up on your doorstep between now and then. Um, sounds good. And, and this uh, obviously is a big part of our budget conversation right. as we prepare for our budget as well because enrollment is an important part of our conversation and making sure that we um, adhere or um, at least fall in line with our class size policies. And we, we certainly have done that this year with our budget. Cool. And we also have our the budget. general fund expenditure report. It's all right. And um, we are keeping a very watchful eye over our fund balances. Um, we, we have seen um, a shift in tuition out of district, which can be uh, found on page nine. And so we did have a, um, an increase in our out of district costs, which is uh, reflected in that tuition out spend line. But as we know from our current budget balance, we were so far able to absorb that into our, our budget. That, that was just unexpected right. students. I think that was a, um, yes, unexpected. you're shaking your head. <laughs> <laughs> unexpected out placements. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's page nine, right? Right. Which line? Uh, 297,415. Third line from the bottom. Yes. <clears throat> and I, I will remind us again, and we'll go through that when we talk about the budget, that what our operational budget is actually, and, and Mary Beth points this out uh, each time, is net circuit breaker. So this does not actually reflect our out-of-district cost, total out-of-district cost, because what is not um, identified in this budget are expenditures that are charged against circuit breaker. And, you know, again, to Paul's point, circuit breaker is an essential part of our funding model, mm -hmm. um, much needed reimbursement revenue that offsets our costs for special education. And a 10% swing, I think we calculated in the letter to Southboro that 10% is about $70,000. I think that was the amount that we had in our letter. And uh, the budget priorities, there they are. There they are. And uh, we're going to take a look at them again in a very um, brief run through of our budget presentation. I do want to mention on the budget calendar that uh, we did have an outstanding meeting with our um, Southboro Advisory Board on January 31st. We were actually a month earlier than in a year before and um, you know it's, it's remarkable to suggest that three and a half hours in front of a financial board was actually an enjoyable evening. but. Um, I think it, well, no, we can't, don't push it. It was. It was. Um, they were very excited about the work that we, we do in our schools each and every day, thanks to the principals and our teachers and our administrative team, and um, very much engaged in the conversation about what we do, and uh, very supportive of that. And this budget reflects our continued collaboration, uh, working with uh, the school committee and our, our financial boards in town, and um, I think basically we received their full support which was a, a great way to end a three and a half hour conversation about money and finances. So what, what is presented this evening um, is very similar to our preliminary budget discussion, right. actually. Yes, I'm yes. oh, yeah. on exactly. a roll call. I'm going to make a motion. Thank you. Thank you. We vote to accept the South Borough Public School District fiscal 2018 budget monthly general fund expenditure report as of January 31st, 2018 until August. Second. Second. Um, any discussions? All in favor? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Paul. Sure. <laughs> um, all right. 
Okay. So, and we have a budget calendar. And um, budget calendar, the next budget meeting is actually town meeting. Well, no, public hearing. Public hearing. Public hearing next month on the budget. But next That's month right. And town meeting. And town meeting. Which is a little, which is early. Early. It's back to its original date. Yeah. And so we're happy about that. So um, I'm pleased to suggest that the budget, that the recommended budget that I have for you this, uh, to present to you this evening, really does encapsulate um, a level service budget but really uh, a budget that also represents growth in our budget priority areas. Um, we've often discussed how important those priorities are um, as we travel through the budget season, which begins almost the first day of the new school year. And tonight, it was um, <coughs> particularly validating to hear so many of the great innovative practices that Kathleen has uh, underway in her building and how each and every one of those can really be um, brought right back to our budget priorities. We continue to fund our technology initiative. Um, it's because we've had a consistent funding um, process in place over these last four years. There have been years that it's, it's um, dipped, and uh, there are years that, that it's been uh, level serviced, and we have found that we are well prepared for it, MPAS 2.0, and we continue to make strides in, in new and exciting ways using uh, technology in the classroom, and not just computers, but also the important technology pieces that support our, our science program as well. Um, and that's, that's, that's uh, pre-K eight. So um, that's well represented in the budget. Uh, our ca ca capital investment in the buildings and building systems is always something that we're very mindful of, and we're very fortunate that in addition to the operational budget line items that support maintenance and building repair, we also um, have the benefit of uh, hosting folks in our schools and that uh, revenue does provide additional support in terms of uh, facilities rental and we are strategic in our deployment of those funds and those funds then have allowed us to do significant upgrades in our buildings, most recently our security upgrades in all of our schools where we've gone to a keyless entry. Uh, as we've mentioned, we have uh, targeted these funds going forward for upgrades to our phone system. We have had many conversations about that and that is well underway and has been over the last year. And then we um, are also looking at that in terms of supporting whatever design changes we hope to make at the Woodward, through the Woodward enhancements. Um, so very strategic deployment of our rental uh, revenue. Uh, certainly alive and well is the integration of the laboratory and the problem solving and the creative thinking that takes place which really underscores the notion of what 21st century skills are all about. And the opportunity for kids to come together and collaborate and solve problems together is so exciting. Um, and we have, again, to, in this budget, <coughs> made some progress for our tuition-free kindergarten model, as we discussed earlier. Um, we have not reduced, this is a level service budget, and so we have targeted, once again, our professional development opportunities to support the growth in staffing and programs that we've realized through our focus on social-emotional learning. Again, this evening throughout the presentation, and it's delightful to have a, a school improvement plan because it brings this all alive. It makes the, lot, the numbers that we work so hard to maintain really um, speak to the, how that translates into improvements and practices in the classroom. And Kathleen mentioned a number of the presenters that we had in for professional development working side by side with our teachers to help uh, realize and actualize some of our, our goals at the building level and then always to maintain our class size and seek the most highly qualified candidates for our school district. We are a place where people want to come and people stay. So our budget process is, um, again, begins early on uh, on the screen. The audience, and we do have an audience this evening, so that's wonderful, mm -hmm. is our um, statement of vision and mission, which also drives and guides our work. Um, there are our budget priorities again, just quickly reviewed. And the budget process. Here are some budget assumptions. We began uh, with a level service budget assumption this year. We had very minimal staff uh, shifts. We always um, are sad to see folks who have been with us for many years leave and retire and continue their retirement careers. Um, but when that happens, it also provides us with an opportunity to capture some savings in the operational budget. This year, um, I think we had zero retirements. And so that made this year 
a little bit more challenging uh, in terms of supporting uh, budget numbers and moving forward. We mentioned our technology goals, they're well in place and um, they have been realized. At Tradia we have that exciting learning, learning management system launch that we'll be hearing a lot about next year I'm sure, if not this year. Um, we just mentioned that we're looking at upgrading our essential communication systems, which is our phone system. We um, pride ourselves in uh, frequent and meaningful communication with our community, and it's also uh, a safety concern for us being able to reach out to our families, and it is an essential tool of our work. Um, we do hope, and we are making some assumptions, that our grant revenues remain at least flat, which basically means we have less money than we did because the costs have not remained flat. Uh, so we're hoping at least in, in uh, actualized dollars through the grants that we have this money. We do not know what our grants are and what available funding is, is out there until August, September. So while we do have a number, number of staff who are um, paid on grants, it makes it very challenging. Uh, when we don't know our budget numbers, our grant numbers, and or they reduce the grants, much like they do reimbursement, circuit breaker reimbursement, without notice. And we won't know that until we, they release the federal and the state entitlement grants. We're hoping they're at least flat. And then our kindergarten model. So we had some impacts this year on the budget. Increased costs in student support services. We did see an increase in our out-of-district costs. Um, and each and every year, our out-of-district educational uh, LEAs, learning uh, associations, do receive an increase. Um, oftentimes, they're approved from the state, and that increase is passed down to us, and it can range from anywhere from 4 to 6 percent in any given year, and so we try to predict what the increase will be and factor that into our budgets. But again, that's something that comes our way with, without um, little notice, and it does have an effect on our budget. And then we're in year one of our three-year contract. What did we have for offsets? This is always, I write it down so I remember how we strategically use this circuit breaker money. Um, in FY19, we are using to offset special education costs a uh, receipt of $652,699 um, in circuit breaker funding, which comes our way based on revenues we received this year, which we were able to realize through our FY17 expenses. So it's a two-year role. We're always banking the year's receipts and budgeting the prior. So um, this is a strategic practice, and we are fortunate that we have not had to necessarily tip into the receipts that we receive now, which otherwise would have been used for FY20's budget. But that 652 is based on the 65%. It's based on the 65%. So it's really this next budget year that we're going to feel the impact of this year's budget cuts at the state. Right. Because we were planful and mindful of it in this budget process. Right. Um, and so, Depending on what happens with um, extraordinary relief, if we are eligible, there may be some additional carryover of a circuit breaker, which we would also apply to the FY 2019 budget. We won't, we won't know that until May. Uh, and again, we continue to utilize facility rental income and sell, uh, capture any reductions due to shifts uh, in services that are required by those students who have um, specialized services in their plan. Can you go back to that item just for one second? Mm -hmm. the, the, um, the reason that the facility rental income is really limited to the one-time expenditures, just remind me of that again. Why we would use it for one-time expenditures? Limited, limited, it's only for one-time expenditures, right? We generally use that as, as if it were a capital expenditure, okay. which in capital expenditures are usually one-time okay. expenditures. And as a strategy to use that to offset day-to-day -day operational, operational expenses. expenses. Okay. And so that allows that us to sense. sort of save that up for one large capital capital expenditure. Or lots of little capital Or lots of little capital expenditures. Um, so in this year's budget, um, it's a level service budget. And when I look, we look at the worksheet, 
and the total budgetary increases, this is actually how it breaks down. We had $894,609 worth of increases. 62% of that was contractual obligations uh, based on staffing. 28% is a special education student program um, shifts in costs. 8% uh, is that transition to kindergarten year two. 1.5%, we've often uh, talked about the importance of trying whenever possible to move staff, critical staffing positions that are on grants onto operational budget whenever we have an opportunity to do that because these positions are key and we could never absorb all of those costs in any single budget year. And then we had a slight uh, uptick, uh, about a half a percent in regular ed busing because uh, this is entering the fourth year of our fifth year contract with NRT and there's usually a gas escalation increase in the um, fourth year of the multi-year contracts. We had from all budget codes, and this is, as you, as you can see, this is a lot of budget line items, it's double-sided. And so looking at all of the budgetary offsets and that number, it encapsulates any reductions on all of the fund codes that are represented in this um, budget that we look at each and every month. So the two combined gives us our incremental budget increase for next year of 3.16%, um, an overall net increase on budget of $624,728. And if we want to see what that looks like, um, where's my piece of the pie here? There it is, and there's the pie. The blue and the purple are the only that, um, pieces of that pie that we have any flexibility with. When you look at the large line group green that's student uh, that's uh, contractual increases the yellow is student programs which are mandated programs and services for our students the kindergarten is the one discretionary piece of that pie that we uh, we factored into our budget basically um, the purple was our choice to move was to move um, staff onto budget a small small piece of someone's salary and then that transportation, that little slice of $5,000 represented in that big pie is actually the transportation uh, escalator for gas. I'm going to shoot back to the previous slide here. And this is really the summation of our kindergarten proposal. It is still a proposal, like as it was last year. We right. remain infinitely flexible on this topic because we don't know what conditions could change. And so this is our proposed preliminary tuition reduction plan for this year. Uh, last year we were able to finalize this in July uh, and I think we might be able to be a little bit of ahead of the curve this year but um, tuition is paid um, on a payment plan and so regardless of what the tuition is the folks who are enrolling their, student, their youngsters in the, the kindergarten program would have a deposit regardless of whatever the tuition amount totally is total was the total for the year. So you see the transition this year um, with the 70,000 that was um, removed from non-operational and moved on to operational budget. Um, we would have 608,000 on our operational budget with 131,000 remaining to shift. This is a little bit of a moving target number and it'll change next year because we have little shifts in staffing sometimes. We may need some additional um, support with instructional assistance and so we remain um, in flux. This year, last year, moving into this year, we actually were able to move um, some additional uh, monies onto operational budget from our projection simply because of, of hiring and where we were in the overall budget. So our proposed tuition for this year uh, from 32.50 last year down to uh, 29.50 will be down to $2,000. We're projecting our revenue based on 100 full-day um, tuition students paying full-day tuition. The remaining part of that um, revolving balance supports the costs that are not on the operational budget right now and allows for us to have some funding available to support the needs of um, spikes that were unanticipated in our enrollment. Um, this year, we have minimal students. Um, Clayton, I don't think that's changed right in our half-day model. So we're going to move uh, forward with our blended model again next year, yeah. which is something we've, we've done. And as we move throughout the year, I think uh, more oftentimes than not, they're full-day full programs. And so 
Uh, with that said, I would uh, request consideration of the committee to approve the FY 2019 recommended budget in the amount of $20,405,986, um, representing a total incremental increase of 3.16%. Repeat that whole thing, or just say Only so if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> I can't the number. Okay, yeah. so uh, I'll move that we approve the recommended um, fiscal year 2019 budget of $20,405,986. As we we'll continue, this is a recommended increase of $624,728. Over the 2018 budget and represents an incremental increase in fiscal year 2019 of 3.16%. I'll second that very detailed. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing it's on tape for the minute person to write. <laughs> Are there discussions? Good work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good, good work. Yeah, I think sure. it's. You know, I, having no, been no, an no. advisory and knowing that this is, you know, agreed upon by the town. I mean, it's not finalized at the town, but um, I think everybody agrees that, you know, it's a good level of services. And where we started, you know, right. a lot of work went into this. So. And it's a lot of work by a lot of people, and I want to thank the principals um, and the central office team. Matt's just joined us. and. I think he's still reeling from the three budget reality. Um, you know, it's like, okay, we just sit there right now. We're going to just go through this budget yeah. process. So it's been a really um, exciting, challenging, stressful day uh, yeah. sometimes trying to get these three budgets uh, ready. Uh, you know, Matt really just came on board in, in uh, November. So the right colors. Um, that's big. Colors. 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 Really We've got that down pat. It was really focused cool. on the principles when we said good work. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we, I was hoping to uh, as well, but <laughs> I think they were first in the, in the compliment. And the teachers, I know you work with the teachers to put all yeah. this stuff together, and, and everyone at Central Office, certainly Greg is um, a, key, a key part, piece of all of the conversations that we have around budget. All right, well, yeah. we should vote tomorrow yeah. before we forget. Okay. So, uh, any other discussions? No, no. let's vote. Okay. Um, all in favor of the motion? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. So, and next month we will have our public hearing. Yes, by fun code only. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Um, last under the superintendent's report committee is our capital plan for next year. Um, and that's really just for distribution. Yep. Exactly. We've discussed this in detail before. So and we always know it's a little bit of a moving target depending on. Um, timing and what gets done. So. I'm, I'm hopeful that um, as we progress through this year and conversations continue that we'll be able to have those final cost estimates for the Wood, wood School um, enhancements which will allow us then to know what our available funding is to move forward with the um, Right. So, more updates to follow. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so, next we have educational policy and um, Approval of grants and donations. So, um, this is interesting. We yes, have it's to, Neary Night. I think this is um, another grant. From the approval of the first T <laughs> National School Program in the amount of $6,000. I don't know who Kathleen is going to talk to. Yes. Uh, so, this is determined by me. It was determined by our physical education teacher, Missy Nash. In, um, with Northboro and Southboro Elementary Schools, bringing so the first national uh, T program brings uh, golfing into our yeah. PE classes, so teaching foundational skills, but it is also uh, encompasses a <coughs> program about the nine core values, so character education, as well as nine healthy habits. And it's a year long, it's a, it's a curriculum that's year long, and they have partnered with Bose. So Bose is um, providing all of the resources and curriculum and training. So they will be bring trainers up from Florida 
to help train our teachers and um, go through the curriculum with them and all the equipment that's needed is all paid for by those. Our neighbor. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes exactly. Yes. So it's, it's, it's exciting yeah. and we're thrilled to bring it on board and Missy's yeah. just excited. She's a golf fanatic, so yeah. just really excited to bring this to the kids. Yeah, yeah. that sounds great. <coughs> Um, yeah. why, why is Bose interested in that? You know, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I was thrilled that somebody was there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, and it also makes sense because Bose is in part, part of South Vernon, and so we support the South Vernon right. School. So if this is a, a program they're supporting, it's nice that they're supporting, supporting us. And I think that's at, uh, it got a little bit, so uh, it's just kind of cool to start with. Yeah. And not only it would, what really um, drew us to this is the character education right. part of it. Because right. a lot of our friends already go, um, are involved in, in different programs, but just to bring this to everybody and right. just spark an interest in a new mm -hmm. sport, perhaps. Right. right. So, the, so this organization is at St. Augustine? Yes. Board? So the trainers will come up from St. Augustine, and actually they're partnering with a few other t local towns. Westboro is talking to them, um, and I think Shrewsbury, I'm not sure. So it makes it more feasible for them to be able to bring their trainers up and go to different districts. But yeah, it's from St. Augustine. It's exciting, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. W is the honorary chair. That's yeah, mm -hmm. it's not that. It's not that good at all. Well, class. We'll take what we can get. Um, so, do we need to make a motion and approve this? Yes. Okay. okay. So. All right. And, and I guess that would be bones for. Oh, it is. It is. <laughs> so I'll move that we approve. The six thousand dollar grant of the first T National School program. Period. Okay. Well, well, should we mention Bose and yeah. the? Well, so Keith just found that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Bose <laughs> is the official home theater system, home audio system, and headphone sponsor of the PGA Tour. That's right. Ah. And oh, champion sponsor. Thought somebody wants to say that loud. Okay. Thank sure. you. Well, that's what I'm here so there's the connection. There's okay. the connection. All right. Thank you. Well, so, so, so Bose is sponsoring this. Um, and I'm stumbling through the motion. And one, one. Oh, right. So, so the motion is for is to accept the six thousand mm -hmm. dollars yes. from from Bose. From Bose. From Bose. Bose. For the yes. first T National. For the first right. T National no School, school program. program. Yes. Okay. That sounds great. Second. Second. All right. Yeah. All right. Discussion. All in favor. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. All right. Sounds great. Um, right. There is no policy development at the time. We have a personnel report somewhere in the time. Yes, and I misspoke. We do have one retirement. It's Marjorie Lebanko, who's been part of the same community for that. some time. Clayton, have you yeah, She's been uh, with us for 20 some odd years as a teacher. She started in our uh, extended day program, and she's been um, part of FIN for a number of years. She actually was at Woodward for a bit and has been back at Finn. And uh, it's sad to see her go. Mm -hmm. um, she's been a, a big staple of our community. So it's all for a resident. Mm -hmm. and she's worked with a lot of kids over the years in special education. So yeah. it's a her. big loss. Yeah, wish her well. Good retirement. So. All right. Um, and action on minutes, um, January 10th meeting. There is a distributed copy that is in the packet with some edits that provided. Okay. Yeah. Paul. Paul, I think your edits are in the Okay.
move that we accept the uh, minutes from January 10, 2018, South Florida School Committee open meeting as edited. Second. All right. Any discussion? All in favor? Motion passes. Thank you. All right. I'm sure we have some bills and payrolls. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Yeah. Yellow. Um, no. Next month, the. Um, <laughs> Right now, I have the fiscal improvement plan on the agenda and the public hearing on the fiscal year 19 budget. Is there anything else? Not for next month, but I think we're targeting April. Paul had mentioned um, a visit from Julie Doyle, okay. and so um, I think she's on deck for April. And I Great. thought we had talked about like the social emotional. Mm -hmm. At some point, is that going to be one of these months? Mm -hmm. Reason okay. the audience we can talk to her about presenting okay. social emotional learning program. So, any other ideas for next month? Anyway, no? all right. Um, and last on our agenda is if we have any audience sharing. They stayed. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so exciting. Um, so. Happy I think Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Um, would anyone like to make a um, motion? We adjourn. I'll second. All in favor? Oh, oh wait. And we have pound cake. Oh, oh, oh. 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 I'll right. So please help yourself. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs>